Good evening and welcome. I'm Doris Wise Montrose, President of Children of Jewish Holocaust Survivors. We are honored tonight to have as our guest Daniel Greenfield, also known as Sultan Knish, blogger extraordinaire. This event is another collaborative effort between the David Horowitz Freedom Center and Children of Jewish Holocaust Survivors. By working together, our two organizations have been able to bring the community some incredible speakers, and tonight is no exception. I would like to mention some upcoming events that you may be interested in. On April 22nd at the Lux Hotel, Children of Jewish Holocaust Survivors is ho hosting another in a series of panel discussions with participants we have come to affectionately refer to as the CJHS Quartet. This panel, the title of this panel is the US, Iran, Israel, and the Bomb. Our quartet is made up of reti um, retired Commander Jennifer Dyer, Professor Avi Bell, Rick Richman, and Omri Sarin. This should be a very provocative evening. The David Horowitz Freedom Center will be hosting at their Wednesday morning club luncheons John Stossel on April 23rd, Charles Murray on April 30th, Robert Spencer on May 16th. In the past, they have hosted such uh, uh, speakers as John, as John Ashcroft, Carl Rove, Colonel Allen West, Michelle Malkin, and the late Andrew Breitbart. The luncheons are lovely and provide a rare opportunity to meet and hear these individuals on a very personal basis. Our speaker tonight is one of the most prolific, diverse, and respected bloggers and writers of our time. There is not a single day of the week without a post on his blog, Sultan Knish, and as a Shillman Fellow of the Horowitz Freedom Center, he has at least one article each week on front page, if not more. Everyone a jewel of knowledge. As an indication of the impact of Daniel's work is his recent designation as a hate group by the Southern Poverty Law Center. Putting aside for a moment how such a designation is an act of incitement against Daniel's personal safety, that they consider his words to be hateful, therefore tells us just how important his work is. Daniel is this century's Jabotinsky. I urge you to visit the Sultan Knish blog. Please turn off your cell phones and other electronic devices. We will have a Q&A after Daniel's presentation, and it is with great pleasure that I introduce you to Daniel Greenfield. Hi, I just want to let you all know that by proximity, you may now be considered a hate group as well. <laughs> I don't know if this can get you any tax exempt status for that, but go for it. We're here to discuss a topic that very rarely gets covered in the news, Israel. It can go for years, months, weeks, days, seconds, without hearing about how the Jewish state is responsible for all the problems in the world. If it wasn't for the Jewish state, the Syrians would be hugging it out right now. The Libyans would be sharing iced mochaccinos together. Egypt would be a haven of peace and freedom for everyone. And women and Christians would be especially respected there. But unfortunately, the Jewish state keeps getting in the way. But we're not here to talk about all those nice people. There are plenty of conferences where very considerate speakers will show up and say that maybe Helen Thomas had a point about the Jews Maybe they should just go back to Poland and Germany. And some less considerate speakers will show up and say maybe they should have never left Poland and Germany in the first place. But we're not here to discuss the people who don't think that Israel should have a future. We're here to discuss Israel's future. Now, before we begin, let me tell you something about myself. I'm pro-Israel. These days, that's a slightly confusing label. Because these days, what exactly is pro-Israel? Is Obama pro-Israel? Is J Street pro-Israel? Is Arafat's ghost pro-Israel? It's a very confusing label now. Recently, a fellow named uh, Peter Beinart, who happens to work for George Soros, come, he came up with a whole new problem, the crisis of liberal Zionism. This week, he had an op-ed which suggested that to save Israel, we have to boycott Israel. <laughs> now, you might remember the day when the left made fun of the right for the whole, you have to destroy the village to save the village. Well, now liberal Zionism has come up with a new one. You have to destroy Israel to save Israel. 
That's the only way to stop Israel from being Israel. But of course, Peter Beinard insists that he's actually, he's not anti-Israel, he's a liberal Zionist. He's a new, he, there's, he's a new form of pro-Israel. There's the kind of pro-Israel that actually supports Israel, and there's the liberal Zionist that's anti-Israel. Now, you may have heard of a fellow by the name of Oliver Sacks, who was a neurologist, who wrote a book called The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat. <laughs> he could write a similar book about Peter Beinart, the leftist anti-Zionist who mistook himself for a liberal Zionist. Now, what do you think Peter Beinart claims? He claims that Obama is not anti-Israel. Obama is a liberal Zionist. No, this is true. According to his thesis, Obama was really a liberal Zionist. He was surrounded by liberal Zionists. And when he's against Israel, he's not really against Israel. He's just being a liberal Zionist. Do you know who else is a liberal Zionist? I have it on good authority. The many members of Hamas are actually liberal Zionists. <laughs> but you never heard it from me. Now, another fun thing that recently happened, uh, a charming, mentally ill man by the name of Gilad Atzmon, who basically claims that Jews are the devil, uh, was rejected by some Palestinian groups for being too anti-Semitic. Now, you know you're really anti-Semitic when the Palestinians say, you're too anti-Semitic for us. But what they claimed was that he was so anti-Semitic so anti because he was a Zionist. In their galaxy, this actually makes some kind of sense. But you know, if we actually assume that what they meant was that he was a liberal Zionist, suddenly this makes a lot of sense. But to get back to the issue, there are two kinds of pro-Israel these days. There's the old-fashioned kind of pro-Israel that supports Israel and believes it should be able to defend itself. And there's the new kind of Israel which believes that it shouldn't. I'm the old-fashioned reactionary kind of Zionist. I support Israel. I believe it should be able to defend itself. And let's discuss how it might be able to survive. Israel, as we all know, began as a dream. If you will it, it is no dream. Well, we willed it, and now it's around. But dreams come in two stages. The first is the falling in love stage. That's the stage where you think that once you attain your dream, everything will be fine. There will be no more problems. Life will be perfect from then on. That's where the Israel began for the Jews. But then there's a second stage of the dream. That's the marriage stage. That's the stage when you realize, yes, there are going to be problems. Yes, there are going to be difficulties. Yes, there are going to be bad days. But the sum of it is worthwhile. That's sort of where we are now. But Israel is still in the early marriage stage. It's still in the stage where we're asking, can we do this for another 10 years, another 20 years, another 40 years, another 50 years? That's where Israel is now. We have the dream, but we're not all that sure that we want the dream in the first place. And there are a whole lot of liberal Zionists telling us that maybe the dream was a bad idea in the first place. But now that we look out at Israel, at all the fights, at all the threats, at all the dangers, we can look at the newspaper and see 40 different articles, all suggesting that Israel is responsible for everything that's wrong. And the marriage suddenly doesn't look all that good. And upstairs, the neighbors are fighting. The Ethiopians, the Russians, the left and the right, the secular, the Mizrahi, the Haredim, all throwing broken dishes at each other. And the downstairs neighbors want to kill them. So can they make it in the long run? Can this marriage work out? Because that is what Israel really is. It's a marriage. We brought together Jews from all the different parts of the world, people often who don't have that much in common, except that they're all Jewish. A lot of them fight. A lot of them are angry at each other. Israel's political culture is almost right up there with Taiwan, except that there usually aren't physical brawls in the Knesset, though there have been. But this is the marriage that we made. First, we fell in love with the idea of having an Israel. Then we got married. We put all these people together in one country. Some of them are on the right. Some of them are on the left. Some of them have decided now that maybe the whole thing was a big mistake. And now we're seeing, can Israel make it for another 50 years? Are we going to have that 50-year anniversary? Actually, it's a 114-year anniversary. But I don't think they make a precious medal for that. Israel's survival is an inevitable. Let's remember that uh, 2,500 years ago, a small group of generally misunderstood people, refugees, 
came back and tried to build the Jewish nation. Uh, we celebrated Hanukkah not too long ago. Hanukkah was, one, was part of the twilight struggle of that nation. It was one of the last gasps of that nation to survive. And it was a very triumphant occasion, but what followed Hanukkah? It followed, what followed it was war, subjugation, slavery, destruction, betrayal, and eventually thousands of years of exile. Israel was destroyed. The second commonwealth of Israel fell. Now the third commonwealth of Israel might also fall. When the Yom Kippur War seemed to be going very badly, General Moshe Dayan told Golda Meir, the third temple is burning. We're not too far from the stage where the third temple might actually be burning, especially as East Jerusalem is on the table, ready to be parceled out and divided to our partners in peace. Who, the only thing that they're missing is East Jerusalem, and once they get it, then they'll stop shooting rockets, they'll stop carrying out terrorist attacks, they'll stop stabbing soldiers, and everything will be fine. All we have to do is give them East Jerusalem. Everything will be fine after that. So Israel's survival isn't inevitable. But what we did accomplish is already amazing. 300 years ago, how many of our ancestors thought that this dream could be made real, that there could actually be an Israel that we could travel to, that we could, make, that we could get on a plane and take a short plane trip to? Not as short for you guys over here on the West Coast, but still, it's accessible. We can live the dream. But the question is, will the dream survive? And that's the real question. Because when you're caught up in a dream, as I've said, you don't see the future. You see the right now, what you can have. But there's also another type of situation where you don't see the future. That's when you're caught in a nightmare. Now, a nightmare is a crisis mode. That's when you can't think about the future. You're stuck in the right now. There are too many problems, there are too many challenges, and we've all been there from time to time. We're surrounded by problems. We're trying to get through this minute, this hour. If we can get through the next hour, if we can get through the hour after that, then we can get through the day and now be okay. Well, you know, guess what? Israel's been living that way for some time now. If you think Israel's political culture is a little insane, even by California standards, there's a reason for that. Israelis are very much carpe diem. They're living in the moment. They're not thinking very far ahead of the future. Israelis re-elect the same people who messed up everything four, eight, 12 years ago, and it's welcome back, Qatar. Netanyahu, Barak, Paris, Paris is back. Paris has had so many, Paris has risen so many times from the grave that he should be considered a savior. He's been buried politically over and over again, and he's back talking about the new, new Middle East and nanotechnology. As Israel's political culture is this constant series of reunions. You either know them because they were originally prime minister, or because they were the sons of somebody who held office. Because there is no real long-term memory. Israel is living in crisis mode, and now we can see out of this crisis mode right now. You, you don't, many of you may have never visited Israel, but you're already in Israel. If you see a sign that says, if you see something, say something, you've already been to Israel. 20 years ago, these signs didn't exist here. They existed in Israel. Because in Israel, if you saw something, you had to say something because it would be a bomb. In the United States now, I can get on the subway train and I see a big sign, if you see something, say something. Because New York is now more like Israel. Parts of Europe are also like Israel. Because Israel's situation has been exported. Israel is the canary in the coal mine. The way that Israel is now is the way that we're all going to be living bit by bit. When you go through the TSA and an air, and to, get to, to get to, say, Los Angeles, in my case, or in New York, in your case, if you have good taste, you're already experiencing some of the Israeli reality. Harried passengers, security guards who don't quite seem to know what's going on and can't really talk about what's going on. Now in Israel, they've had to preserve airline security because if airline security in Israel goes, that's it. Israel is completely cut off. It's all gonna be cruises from then on in. But in the United States, the United States still has a buffer zone. The United States can say, okay, we're not really going to discriminate against Muslims. We're not gonna single out Muslims. We're gonna single out the nuns and the three-year-olds in the wheelchair. And uh, this way the Muslims won't be offended and they will be less likely to commit terrorism against us. So the laxer we are in fighting terrorism, the more Muslims will like us. This is actually the platform of the Democratic Party, by the way. <laughs> this, is, uh, this is the foreign policy of the Obama administration. The more, the more the weaker we are, the more they'll like us. Speak really, really softly and carry a small, unsharpened pencil. <laughs> but I think some of us also can relate to this, this kind of crisis mode on behalf of Israel. When you read news articles after news articles, 
You see CNN reporting live from the latest Palestinian who was innocently minding his own donkey when suddenly an Israeli helicopter shot out of the sky and blew him and his suicide bomb up for no reason whatsoever. He was just delivering the suicide bomb over to his sick grandmother who needed a suicide bomb to get well. <laughs> but we can get into this crisis mode when we see this happen because we, it's overwhelming. There's deluderization on one side, there's a boycott on the other. You've got activists demanding that we boycott Israeli cosmetics. You've got others breaking windows. You've got Jewish children being killed. You have violence and hate all around us. So we can see, we can sink into that crisis mode a bit too. And we can wonder, can Israel survive? Is there any hope at all? There is hope. Do you know why? Because Israel has come back more times than Shimon Peres has. <laughs> as much damage as Shimon Peres has done, Israel has come back more times and survived more times. We've had three commonwealths. We're on our third commonwealth now. Most nations don't get, don't get to number two. The Assyrians don't have a government. They had an empire, no government. The Greek empire, the Greeks are not doing too well these days. They're kind of bankrupt. This is madness. This is inflationary spending. The rest, the Babylonians, you know, they've just, they're, the Shiites and the Sunni Babylonians are busy killing each other. They're not likely to make much of a major comeback these days. Even the Ottoman Empire is deep in debt. And Egypt, you know, they're going to be selling the pyramids soon in exchange for food. <laughs> but Israel has come back over and over again. Israel is the comeback kid. Israel exists in the fines of history. Longfellow wrote a poem back before the days of Zionism in Israel that said, I looked at all these sad graves and said, it's such a shame. You know, these Jews, they read the book, they read everything backward. And from their point of view, everything is going to come back now, but sadly, it's not the way it is. We read in English, and that which once was shall be no more. The, pay, the books aren't going to be read the other way. And look, here's Israel, and we're reading everything the other way. Because Israel has made a comeback. Israel is predictably unpredictable. Israel has always been on the brink of destruction. In 1948, it was ridiculously on the brink of destruction. It was on the brink of destruction in 1967. People said, that's it. We're not going to be able to do anything. The Russian ambassador came to the Israeli prime minister and got him out of bed and told him, that's it. There's going to be a war very shortly, and there's nothing you can do about it. And the Israeli prime minister offered to show him around. We have no hostile intentions. We're not going to attack anybody. We don't want to attack anybody. And the Russian ambassador said, I don't care. You're finished. And shortly thereafter, Israel launched one of the most incredible operations in history, and took out the Egyptian Air Force on the ground. That very Egypt, expensive Egyptian Air Force that the Soviet Union spent a huge fortune building up. Now, I've met some veterans, some Soviet veterans, who, whose job was to train all these Arabs to help fi to fight Israel. Do you know how much they hated them? They would say, we brought them hundreds and hundreds of millions of rubles worth of equipment top-of-the-line equipment, equipment that we don't have. We gave it to them. We set it up for them. We showed them how to use it. And they blew it all up. They hated them. And you know why? Because Israel kept coming back. The Arabs couldn't do it, even with Soviet equipment. They couldn't do it war after war after war. So they switched tactics. They went for the pity vote. They gave up trying to destroy Israel with the frontal attack. And they went straight for, I'm so poor, I only have this rock and this suicide bomb and this rocket on my back. What can I possibly do? Israel has to give me East Jerusalem or there'll be no peace at all. But Israel is here, and Israel is back. And while it faces destruction time and time again, it's not going anywhere. At least I hope not. And with people like you, we can keep up the good fight so that it doesn't go anywhere. And as we now go, let's move on to discussing Israel in 2062, the far, far distant future where Obama is faint and obscure as Rutherford B. Hayes. <laughs> the question is, how is Israel going to get over there to 2062? How is Israel going to get to that future? Because look, Iran has a nuclear bomb, or it's going to have one shortly. And what is Israel going to do about it? Maybe they're going to launch an operation, maybe not. But 50 years from now, you can't keep destroying the nuclear bombs over and over again. 
And in the long run, sooner or later, everyone else will have those nuclear weapons as well. For example, Egypt has a nuclear program. That's the fun-loving country that, thanks to the Arab Spring, is now about to be taken over by the Muslim Brotherhood, and they've got a nuclear program. And I've got even better news for you. In January of this year, nuclear material went missing from an Egyptian nuclear power plant. I'm sure it's being put to good use. Now on top of that, the IEAE, which generally has a firm policy of ignoring any illegal nuclear activity by Muslim countries, has said that Egypt is engaged in, in illegal enrichment. So forget Iran. Iran is just part one. Part two is Egypt, whose leaders are going to be just as much anti-Israel as Iran's leaders are. And unlike, uh, unlike Iran, Egypt's population actually hates Israel. Iran's population doesn't. And of course, with them, we've got the Saudis. They also want a nuclear program. And they've got their hand on the wheel in Washington. They've got a whole lot of money. And they happen to fund terrorists now and again. But there are good allies in the war on terror. So that's three major countries that are likely to go nuclear. I'm not even counting Turkey here, which is its own department. The bottom line is that 50 years from now, the Middle East will be nuclear. That's a reality. The question is, how is Israel going to survive all that? And the answer is simple enough. Most of you have lived through it, mutually assured destruction. Israel needs a nuclear deterrent. Sure, this kind of thing where we go to Washington every time and ask the president to do something about Iran's nuclear program, it's not really that great of a strategy, as you can see. Israel can occasionally take out a nuclear program in the case of Iran. And by the way, I feel that they should very much take out Iran's nuclear program. But in the long run, thinking strategically, thinking of the future, thinking 20, 40 years from now, Israel is going to need a nuclear deterrent. Now the question is, how is that nuclear deterrent going to come about? Let's pull back a little and take a look at the two types of nuclear attacks that Israel might face, overt and covert. Now the overt attack is fairly straightforward. Overt attack is Iran launches. There are a few, there is a statement with a whole bunch of Allahu Akbars in there, and maybe an Obama Akbar in there also. The missile falls. The West sort of condemns it and says, that wasn't nice at all. And maybe, maybe, maybe offers to take in the survivors. And then Obama goes to the UN Security Council and asks them for a condemnation. And for a wonder, they actually condemn it without any military action. And then Obama imposes more sanctions. And liberal Jewish readers pat themselves on the back for how pro-Israel Obama is because he got the UN Security Council to condemn Israel's destruction after the fact. I don't think this is an outcome that we, any of us really want. But at this point, this is what we're on track for if we don't do something about it. That's the straightforward overt attack. Now, we can counter this by straightforwardly destroying Iran's nuclear program, which I think Israel will do probably within the year, at least if, that's the, if the talk from Jerusalem is any indication. But in the long run, Israel is going to need a nuclear deterrent, which means it's going to have to be able to say, yes, we do have nuclear weapons. It's the worst kept secret in the world. We have a whole lot of nuclear weapons. And you know what's going to happen if you attack us? We're going to race every city that you happen to have and have any attachment to off the map. Now, is this a workable strategy? First, let's look at why an Iranian nuclear bomb is so dangerous to Israel. Now, it took the Soviet Union quite a while to work its way up to the point where it could destroy the United States. First, you had uh, nuclear bombs that were dropped by planes. Then you had intercontinental ballistic missiles. You had an arms race. And it was building up slowly by slowly until there was enough nuclear weaponry there to actually destroy the United States. Now, Iran is going to have a day one capability for destroying Israel. There are two reasons for that. One, Israel is really, really small. Israel is smaller than all but three American states, Connecticut, Delaware, and Rhode Island. It also has a better economy than all three, <laughs> especially Rhode Island. But Israel is small, and it's dense. It has a very dense population. Jews tend to live clumped up, and in Israel, they live really, really clumped up. Israel has the 37th highest population density in the world. That is a lot. You want to know how much that is? Japan has the 32nd highest population density in the world. And Japan has cubicle hotels and apartments so small you can hardly turn in. Now, if you eliminate islands, principalities, and city-states off the list, then Israel has the 10th highest population density in the world. If you think that's claustrophobic, wait. Tel Aviv is one of the 50 most overpopulated cities in the world. And the Tel Aviv metropolitan area 
holds about half of Israel's population. How big is the Tel Aviv metropolitan area? About the size of Los Angeles. Now imagine the Cold War if half the population of the United States lived in Los Angeles. I know driving on the freeways it might seem like that sometimes, but that would be nuclear, instant nuclear blackmail. And to make matters just that little more, more worse, most of Tel Aviv is Jewish. So it's a perfect target. If Iran detonates a bomb anywhere, it will be in Tel Aviv, and it'll likely mean the end of Israel. But it hasn't happened yet, and I don't think it will happen. Just to reassure some of the people in the audience. Because there's also a flip side to this. Do you know something fun about Iran? Over 10% of its population is based out of Tehran. Also Iran, you might not think to look at it, but it has a majority urban population, which means it is vulnerable in turn. Now not all of Iran's population lives in the cities, and they do have a lot of cities, but Israel reportedly has a lot of nukes. And if you take out those cities, even if you take out Iran, you've basically crippled Iran's political, military, scientific, cultural, and religious elite. You be, they cease to exist as a country, and they happen to know this. Now, Ahmadinejad is crazier than a raccoon floating in a barrel of wine, but he's not really making the decisions anymore. And sure, they talk about how much we love death, we love death, we want to marry death, we want to have death's babies, but tell you what, don't believe it. I'll t Here's how I can tell you why. Have you been to Gaza? Anybody been to Gaza? No. But Gaza has some amazing mansions. And those mansions, they belong to the leaders of the Fatah and Hamas movements. Now, people who live in huge, huge mansions, looking over by the sea, sipping wine that they're not supposed to have, with four Mercedes in every garage, those people don't love death. Now, Iran, the Iranian elite, the clerical elite, these guys are not living in sackcloth and ashes. These guys run the Iranian economy. They like the good things in life. The Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, the guys who finance all this, the Saudis, the Saudis, they like the Lamborghinis, they like the good life. People who like the good life do not love death. The biggest myth that Islam has created is that it loves death. It does not love death. It sends mentally ill people, it sends disgraced women, it sends people who are drugged up, much like the Japanese kamikaze pilots were, to bowl themselves up, to make a point. Any of us is prepared to die, any of us. No, they're not. When was the last time a Hamas leader blew himself up? When was the last time the son of a Hamas leader, the daughter of a Hamas leader blew himself up? It doesn't happen. Most of the people who bowl themselves up are marginally affiliated with them at best. Often they're completely unaffiliated. Sometimes they have medical problems, often they have psychological problems. They do not love death, but they want us to think that they love death. Osama bin Laden was laughing at the guys who flew planes into the World Trade Center. He thought they were suckers. And they were, they were suckers. Osama bin Laden was not flying planes into the World Trade Center. He wasn't eager to be a martyr. He had a whole bunch of, he had his own 72 virgins who were apparently all fighting with each other all the time. He was not into this lifestyle. These people want to live. They want us to think that they don't care. They're bluffing. And the thing to do is to bluff them right back. You love death, we love death even more. You want to try and destroy us? See what happens. It's called mutual assured destruction. You know what? It worked in the Cold War, and in the Cold War we weren't up against courageous peasants and workers. We were up against the commissars, living like czars, having all the good stuff in life. These people did not want to die. Khrushchev did not want to die. Stalin did not want to die. Andropov did not want to die. These guys wanted to live. The Hamas leaders, the leaders of Iran, they want to live. And the reality is that there's a checkmate. If they have nuclear weapons, we have nuclear weapons. But the checkmate depends on one thing. It's not enough to have a weapon. If Pee Wee Herman has an AK-47, that doesn't make him dangerous. He's still Pee Wee Herman. That's not a deterrent. For there to be a deterrent character, personality, and perception matters more than anything else. The United States during World War II, before World War II looked pretty intimidating. Why would the Japanese bomb Pearl Harbor? What were they thinking? Well, they were thinking that the United States was weak, that it was a paper tiger, that it wanted to avoid confrontation very badly, that it had stayed out of World War II because it was afraid it could be intimidated. So bomb Pearl Harbor, push the United States around a little, and the United States will give you everything they want. They were wrong, obviously, as they learned to their own nuclear dismay, but this is how nations that want to go to war with you normally think. They don't think, wow, those people are so brave. 
they'll stand up to us. No, they think these people are weak and cowardly. They're not going to do anything. If we attack them, they'll run away. They'll hide under the table. We don't have anything to worry about from them at all. And that is where the deterrent part comes in. The Soviet Union thought this way about the United States. And we had to show them that we were willing to go to war. We were willing to stand up to them over the Bay of, oh, uh, at the Cuba blockade. We weren't going to allow nuclear missiles to go up in Cuba. And once Khrushchev understood that we weren't going to be pushed around anymore, that was it. From then on, it was a perfect stalemate. There, was not, there weren't going to be any more pushback. The problem is that Israel has kept allowing itself to be pushed around and around and around and around. I mean, at this point, Israel is fighting for the right to build homes in East Jerusalem, which the world insists on describing as a settlement, which it is a settlement. It's the oldest settlement known to man. It's, it's about five, 6,000 years old. That is really, it's the granddaddy of the settlements. But Israel has allowed itself to be pushed around. When there's a casualty, when there's a civilian casualty, Israel says, oh my God, we're torn up about this. Our soldiers need psychological counseling after this. We would never do this on purpose. We would never kill a Muslim civilian on purpose. Well, if you, if you want to have a nuclear deterrent, you have to be able to say, we are willing to kill millions of Muslim civilians. And, the way to, and that sounds pretty horrible, of course. It is pretty horrible. We would be killing millions of people, and plenty of them are innocent. The way to avoid having that happen is to bluff really, really well. If we bluff really well, then we never have to get to that point. That's the problem here. You know what the motto of the Strategic Air Command was? The command that was going to drop all those nuclear missiles and end the world effectively, according to the left? Their motto was, peace is our business, which is really a crazy motto. How is peace our business? We're deploying nuclear weapons. You know, we're all here. None of us got blown up by nuclear missiles. Their business paid off really, really well because the United States demonstrated that it could not be intimidated. Now, let's say the United States had unilaterally gotten rid of its nuclear arsenal if Jimmy Carter had been twice as crazy as he was and he'd been around for, for 30, 40 years in the White House. The United States had unilaterally dismantled and said, we are not going to have nuclear missiles. And there were a lot of people who wanted the United States to do this. What would have happened? Well, we would have had a nuclear war. We just wouldn't have been the ones fighting the war, we wouldn't have been the ones launching missiles, but we would have been on the receiving end. Because what the Strategic Air Command understood was that the threat of killing millions of people is sometimes necessary to save millions of lives. And that way you don't have to kill those people. That way those people don't have to die. And this is the bottom line that Israel needs. Israel needs a nuclear deterrent. Taking out Iran's nuclear program, it's good for now, but over the long run, thinking of the future 5, 10, 20 years from now, Israel is going to have to have the perception that it is not just committed to the Samson option, that it is 100% committed to the Samson option. So what is Israel going to be like in 2062? Think of America in 1962. There are going to be some similarities. Israel is going to be in a Cold War with what is likely to be a Muslim caliphate. Maybe by that time the Muslims will say, okay, this whole Islam thing hasn't worked out, but so will become uh, secular liberals let's have female prime ministers and bikini competitions and gay bars in Mecca. You know, it could happen 50 years from now, you never know. But most likely Israel will be between a caliphate and it will have very little Western support because by that point a number of European countries will have gone almost entirely Muslim, certainly above the 50% mark. So expecting support from there is a dead end. Expecting support from the United States, who knows? I don't know what the United States is going to be like in 50 years because the trajectory is hard to plot and frankly, I like the United States. I don't want to plot its trajectory in 50 years from now. So Israel is going to have to be dependent on itself. And the way to protect itself is not going to be going to Washington and saying, and getting up at APAC and saying Iran is a huge threat. I mean, this is fine for now. It's not, it doesn't have a future. Maybe the United States will figure out that its interests are in resisting Islam. Maybe. I would like very much to think that will happen. But Israel has to act, it has to think of a future where it's not going to have the patronage of the United States just as it was the patronage of France a while back. And that means Israel is going to have to be a lot like the United States in 1962. It's going to have to be the country that is holding back the tide of darkness. And it's going to have to be doing that with a nuclear deterrent. Now I mentioned two forms of attack, overt and covert. Overt is the official statement, Tawah Akbar, missiles go up. The covert one is Iran or Egypt or the Saudis, who are our wonderful allies, will meet with some of the terrorist groups that they fund and say, here are some nuclear materials, go and do what you want. And then a suitcase nuke goes off in Tel Aviv. Now, maybe this doesn't kill a few million people, maybe only kills 100,000. That's already bad enough in a country of 8 million. 
which means Israel's nuclear deterrent has to go beyond merely just covering a direct attack. It has to cover situations where they're not clear who did it, which means every Muslim country must be on the receiving end. Now that sounds very belligerent, and you know what it is. It is very belligerent. But do you know what it does? It turns the tables. Now, what did, the, what did the Muslim countries do to Israel? Israel won several wars. It was ahead of the game. Israel was strong. Now, how do you win a fight? You turn your opponent's strength into a weakness. You turn your own weakness into a strength. Now, it suddenly wasn't a bunch of Arab armies fighting Israel. It's these poor nationalistic guerrillas who just want their own homeland in all of Israel. How could you not feel sorry for them? They turned Israel's strength into a weakness. Now, Israel's strength was that it had potents. It had mobility. It could do what it wanted. Then every single thing that Israel did was condemned. Whatever Israel did, anything it did, was condemned. And what Israel did in response to that was basically shut everything down. It, start, it started double-checking everything, triple-checking everything, rethinking everything, and being afraid to actually do anything. And this, by the way, is what happens in abusive marriages, where you get berated and belittled a lot. You start to shut down, and you start to question everything you do. So Israel went into that mode. Israel went from being strong to being weak. Its strength became a weakness. Now a nuclear bomb is strength. All these countries that want to have a nuclear bomb think this is potency. This will allow us to do anything we want. We are going to be in charge when we have a nuclear bomb. But no. Now we have to turn their strength into a weakness. We have to turn their sense of potency, their sense of power, into a weakness. And how do we do that? Instead of having power through a nuclear bomb, they now just enter themselves into a conflict with Israel that has no possible winners. You can't win this. As those of you who have seen the movie War Games know, you can't win a nuclear conflict. But Israel doesn't need to win the nuclear war. That's the thing. Israel isn't expanding. Israel want, for Israel, a stalemate is enough. A nuclear stalemate is just fine for Israel. Israel doesn't need to expand. So what Israel needs to do is to checkmate. What they think is going to be a form of strength becomes a form of weakness because it limits their action. Now, when we extend that nuclear deterrence to terrorists, suddenly every Muslim country is responsible for every t Muslim terrorist group around. If a Muslim terrorist group carries out an attack, they're going to be on the receiving end. If they don't alert Israel ahead of time, if, somebody is crazy, if they know that somebody is crazy enough to provide them with nuclear materials, they have to stop them or tell Israel because the alternative is a nuclear war that will end up destroying them. It shifts the responsibility for Israel's security. It shifts the control of power over to Israel. Now, where do all these terrorist groups come from? They're funded by most of the same countries that want the nuclear weapons. So now they have a choice. They can have nuclear weapons or they can have terrorists. But they're not going to have both for very long. Now, even if they say, if the Egyptians and the Iranian leaders say, OK, it's not worth it. We're not going to nuke the Zionist entity. We're not going to give nuclear weapons to terrorists. It's still not reliable enough because the pipeline is broken. You see in the Khan network in Pakistan, or the nuclear material that went missing in Egypt, it only takes people in the pipeline, influential, corruptible people, to pass along nuclear materials. Which means that the second part of this is that Israel has to deal with its terrorist problem. The two greatest threats to Israel's survival in the long term are terrorism and nuclear proliferation, and the two come together. As I've explained, the direct nuclear attack is probably unlikely. But a covert one by a terrorist group is extremely likely, especially as long as the other side thinks that Israel is probably not going to strike back if there's any doubt. Now, the only proper way for Israel to control its own borders is to root out the terrorist groups. Israel cannot continue with the status quo indefinitely, which brings us to the second part of the story, Palestine in 2062. Now, as we all know, the nation of Palestine has a long, ancient, and proud history. <laughs> It began with Palestinus Rex, the suicide bombing dinosaur. <laughs> then it continued to Homo Palestinus, who invented the suicide bomb filled with rocks. It didn't work very well, and he went extinct. But actually, the so-called state of Palestine is around 40, 50 years old, even less than that. But Newt Gingrich is wrong, absolutely wrong, when he calls them an invented people. That's not true. They're not an invented people. The Smurfs are an invented people. <laughs> the Pal the Palestinians are a manufactured people, which is slightly different. They're, ma they're manufactured to do one thing. They're weaponized. They're a weaponized culture. Now, you had the, some of you have seen the Kani 2012 video. It's the same idea, except on a much larger scale. Except the Kani guy is an amateur. Arafat was a professional. When Israel negotiated with Arafat, peace now, 
we're going to have good times now. We're going to give Arafat control of a whole lot of people, their kids, and their educational system. So what we got was the Holy Wards Resistance Army. Arafat took control of the educational system and used it to breed suicide bombers and terrorists, which was obviously completely, completely inevitable. But the Palestinians were a manufactured people. They were weaponized to destroy Israel. After the other Arab nations couldn't actually win the war, they turned to militia groups. Now, the Middle East is full of militias. It's full of militias that, are, that don't claim to, to be a nation. Some militias do claim to be a nation. The Kurds actually have some claim on this. But there are a lot of militias in the Middle East, and if you give them money, they will kill people for you. How is Israel assassinating Iranian nuclear scientists? They found a friendly militia that likes money and weapons. They gave them money and weapons, and they're assassinating Iranian nuclear scientists. Anybody can do this, and anybody's been doing this for a while. Now, pretty much everybody has some of these militias on their payroll. The United States has one of these militias on their payroll. You may have heard of this militia. It's called the Palestinian Authority. It collects billions and billions of taxpayer dollars. There's an entire UN agency dedicated just to funding this militia. It's become a really big militia these days. There are millions and millions of refugees, and there are always more and more refugees cropping up. At this point, uh, at some point in time, Middle East, we just consist entirely of Palestinian refugees who just want to go home, except for the Saudis who are happy where they are until they go bankrupt. If they do go bankrupt, if they run out of money, then they'll also become Palestinian refugees. Now, actually, the original Saudi refugee, forget Palestinian refugee, there's a major Saudi refugee problem in Jordan, which is the original Palestine. Now, their king is a Saudi refugee, the Hashemite kingdom, and uh, he migrated on down from what is now Saudi Arabia, and now there's a king of Jordan. There's a whole dynasty of them, actually, even though they're really not from around here. But then so, the same goes for the Palestinians. The, the Hussein clan, I'm not talking about the guy in the White House, the Mufti, but the, beginning with the Mufti of Jerusalem and ending with uh, Arafat, they were a regional family that decided to move over and take over Jerusalem back in the day, and back in the day is a few hundred years ago, not that long ago. You've got all these powerful families struggling for power throughout the Middle East, and some of those families decided that there was an advantage in calling themselves Palestinians, even though it's a regional name, and they weaponized their own people into one of the biggest militias around. Now, Israel's mistake was to take all this seriously and to negotiate with them, to assume that if you can give them their own state, then you can set their own borders, and everything will be fine. Of course it's not fine, because there's no real Palestinian nationality. We keep talking about the two-state solution. It's now the three-state solution, counting Hamas, Fatah, and Israel. Of course, counting Jordan, it's the fourth-state solution. If Al-Qaeda manages to create its Islamic Emirate, which it wants to do, it will be a five-state solution. But let's look at the concept of a two-state solution. What problem is a two-state solution solving? Is it solving the problem of Palestine? No, its solution is Palestine. It's solving the one-state problem, and the one-state problem is Israel. Now, you know, they're not the first to come up with the idea of a Jewish problem. A Jewish problem has been a common concern for a whole lot of people, some of them German-speaking. Still, still German-speaking some of these days, if you've heard the latest statements from the German opposition leader. Israel is an apartheid state, and we know all about apartheid states. Now, once you create the perception that there is a problem, that there is a Jewish problem, then it has to be solved. The Nazis didn't invent the idea of a Jewish problem. They just piggybacked on it. They said, okay, we have this idea of a there's a Jewish problem. Here's how we propose to solve it. Now, with Israel, the problem is that if there's an ongoing problem, if there's a perception that there's an ongoing bleeding sore, then there are going to be a whole lot of people who want to solve this problem. And Israel's mistake was to let them try solving the problem. Now that they've been trying to solve this problem for around 20 years or so, the problem has gotten much, much worse. But the two-state solution is that we have to continue the two-state solution. Now, I mentioned the crisis of liberal Zionism before. The crisis of liberal Zionism is directly linked to the two-state solution. Because if you have a two-state solution, who, whose side are you on? You're on the side of two states, Israel and Palestine. So you're on the side of the people shooting at Jews. You're also on the side of the Jews. That's why going to a baseball game and cheering for the Mets and the Cardinals, I hope they both win. They both can't win. The two-state solution is schizophrenic. And that is the problem with the whole idea that there's a liberal solution. 
J Street calls itself pro-peace. Okay, that's fine, I like pro-peace, pro-sunshine, pro-goodness, pro-happiness, those are all good things, but who's supposed to provide these things? Who's supposed to provide the peace? The Palestinians are not supposed to provide the peace. Israel is supposed to provide the peace. And how is Israel supposed to provide the peace? It's supposed to continue this whole fun, fun, endless two-state solution. Now, the two-state solution has completely failed for 20 years. Why has it failed? We, let's say, okay, Arafat is a bad, bad man, no denying that, but couldn't it succeed at least to some extent? Didn't he want his own country? Why did the two-state solution keep failing? Why is it still failing? Why isn't there anybody in the Palestinian Authority who says, let's be reasonable here, okay, we hate the Jews, we're always going to hate the Jews, but this is our opportunity to have our own country, so we'll make a deal, we'll get some money from the West, we'll get the land, we'll begin building up a country, we've got a flag, we've got an anthem written for us by a Greek anti-Semite whose family believed the Jews drank blood, but more about that later. We've got our anthem, we've got our flag, why not have a country? Why is the two-state solution constantly failing? It's supposed to fail. The two-state solution was never meant to succeed. If you take away nothing else from this, just take away this. The two-state solution is the gateway to the one-state solution. Just like Obama's bailout of the banks is the gateway to nationalization. It's a, the two-state solution is meant to fail. Now autonomy, the original thing was autonomy. There's going to be an autonomous territory. That was a gateway drug. You know, you talk about gateway drugs. That was a gateway drug to the two-state solution. The two-state solution is a gateway drug to the one-state solution where we pour everybody into the same country. And it's just like Lebanon and, or Kosovo, and we're going to have a designated maybe Jewish president and a designated Muslim prime minister. And this is going to last for about five years until it all goes to hell, just like Lebanon does every five years. And the one-state solution, what is that the gateway for? The no-state solution, which was the original plan all along. Syria takes over, Egypt takes over, they gobble up the land. All the Palestinian nationalists whose hearts bleed for Palestine will retire in Paris along with Arafat's wife because they're not idealists, they're not nationalists, they're opportunists. All this was a scam, it's been a scam all along. And this creates this kind of commitment. The thing is, have any of you ever bid in penny auctions? Do you know what that is? The idea is simple enough. You just start small. You make a small commitment. You've seen this with gambling. You start with a dollar, then ten dollars, then a hundred dollars. You wouldn't normally just plop down a hundred dollars. You wouldn't gamble a hundred dollars straight off. You escalate the commitment. Then it's one, then it's five, then it's ten. First it's, a, a few, it's, first, it's giving them a little space in Jericho, give them control of the territories where the Palestinians already live, then give them Gaza, then give them East Jerusalem. You escalate the commitment. And if you've been doing this for 20 years, then you can't think of another way to function anymore. You're already committed fully to this approach. And it's hard at this point to turn around and say, we were wrong, we were completely wrong, and now we have to jettison all this. Because the commitment has been creeping. It's like the lobster being slowly cooked. Israel has been very, very slowly cooked until now East Jerusalem is on the table. And what happens after East Jerusalem? Remember, the two-state solution is the gateway to the one-state solution. The one-state solution is not just the 1967 borders, but where there's no magic number here. The 1967 borders, the 1948 borders, there is no magic number that is going to solve all this. There's no point in time where you can go back. Well, actually, there is a point in time. But going back to 1967 is not going to fix anything. Going back to 1948, the big Nakba, it's not going to fix it either. 1917 and the Balfour Declaration, still no. 1897 and the first Zionist Congress in Basel, also no. You want a date where we can actually go back to that will fix everything? 627. You know what happened in 627? Muhammad's first major massacre of the Jewish population. That is where they really want to go back to, the caliphate. Now they would do it piece by piece. 1967, 1948, 1939, 1917, 1897, and there we go, it's 627, it's the caliphate over again. And Jews are dimmies, those who have actually survived. To actually deal with the situation, Israel is actually going to have to break with everything it's done, which means that in 2062 there will be no Palestine if there is also an Israel. There will either be no Israel, or there will be an Israel and no Palestine because Palestine is just a weaponization. It's weaponization of a people, it's the weaponization of an identity, but its ultimate goal is not to create a nation state. If they had wanted that, they could have had it now for quite a while. Its goal is the destruction of Israel. The Palestinian 
identity, there is really no Palestinian identity that is detached from Israel. If you cut away everything that involves Israel, there would be no Palestinian identity because there is nothing there. It's just the dark side of Israel. It's like the stalker. It has no, it has no unique identity. It, is just, it has just one governing obsession, Israel. It's poetry, Israel. It's anthem, Israel. It's whole national reason for wanting a nation, Israel. There is nothing there to them without Israel. And Israel has to get rid of the shadow. Israel has to do what it should have done all along, which is instead of bargaining, bargaining is one of the stages of, of grief until at some point you get to acceptance. We're a little too close to acceptance already. Instead of bargaining, turn back the clock. Go back to denial. Denial is much healthier, especially if you ship them off over closer to denial, which is a much better place for, you for them to be. Israel cannot secure its borders until it actually roots out the terrorist groups. Now, this is actually completely entirely doable. Israel used to do this all the time. Then we had the peace process, and we decided, no, this, is, this sort of thing can't be done at all. It's going to be too upsetting. It's better to just build walls and retreat behind complicated systems that are going to solve everything. You hear about how effective Iron Dome is. Well, Iron Dome is effective. Israel is great at technology. But do you know the problem? You can't solve human problems with technology. Not the kind of problems where there are two sides playing on both sides. For example, crime. Can you solve crime with technology? I mean, you can solve individual crime, criminal cases, but can you solve the social problem of crime itself? No, you can't. I mean, how many of you have alarm systems in your cars and your homes? Does it stop? Does it stop break-ins? I mean, it stops some of them, but it doesn't eliminate them because human beings find ingenious ways around technological solutions. Building a technological wall doesn't prevent the other side from finding ways around it, like shooting rockets over it. You can create checkpoints, they can find ways around checkpoints. You can put up walls, they can shoot over the walls. There's always a counter for everything, and that's the real problem. And at some point, if they keep escalating, if better and better weapons fall into their hands, then things are going to get very ugly. Now, what would they do with weapons of mass destruction? We're shortly coming up on Pesach Passover. Let's go back to Pesach 2004, where some fund members of the Al-Aqsa militia, which is funded by your tax dollars, by the way, through the Palestinian Authority, got, they decided they had a great plan. They were going to get hold of some HIV-positive blood and use it in a bomb. They didn't actually succeed in doing it, but imagine these people with nuclear materials. And again, this sort of thing is coming because why were these people... I said that the Palestinians are manufactured people. What were they manufactured to do? They were manufactured to destroy Israel. They're a weapon. Their only purpose is to serve as a weapon for neighboring Arab countries, and not so neighboring ones for that matter. So those countries will pass along increasingly sophisticated weapons to them down the pipeline. When those countries get rockets, the Palestinians get a more primitive version of the rocket. When they get nuclear weapons, sooner or later the Palestinians get a suitcase nuke because that's what they're built to do. They were created for this purpose. Now, for Jews, a lot of this is hard to grasp because we're idealists. And that's true in Israel, no matter how hard-headed how hard the Israelis sometimes seem, we're idealists. We try to see the, way, the world the way it should be. That's why we create all these wonderful utopian movements dedicated to making the world a better place. We have all these amazing geniuses and thinkers who can't see the world for what it is. Because in a way, we're immature. We're both old and we're young. And for Israel to really break free of all this, we are going to have to grow up. We're going to have to become, we're going to have to f come face to face with reality. So what will Israel be like in 2062? The topic of this talk? Is it going to have flying cars, space elevators? Will, it, will dinner come in a pill form so you can just swallow it and that's that? Everything made of chrome, space elevators? Maybe some of those things will be real, I don't know, but that's not really the point because the technology isn't the point. First of all, to survive, it has to change in personality and in character, not in technology. So Israel is going to have to grow up. Now, what does growing up mean, really? As children, as teenagers, we see things in black and white, good or bad, no compromises. We want the ideal. We want to be ideal. And of course, that's been used very effectively against Israel. It's been used very effectively against the United States. How is the war on terror undermined? Abu Ghraib. Guantanamo Bay, now we're the bad people. We wanted to be the good guys, we wanted to be the cowboys, we wanted to be the heroes. Now suddenly we look like the bad guys and we can't handle it. 
The Israelis can't handle it that well either in many cases. They don't like feeling like the bad guys. They want it to be the pioneers, the tolerant people, the, the, the Democrats in the Middle East, the one nation where everybody has freedom, where everyone has equal rights. Israelis want to be that. They don't like this kind of thing where we have to have checkpoints, we have to search Muslims, we have to put them in jail. We have to, and then we, we get on the news, all these, we get the news there's a father holding his wounded child. We don't want it, this. Nobody wants this. But growing up means doing things that you don't want to do. It means accepting that reality is not ideal, that your life maybe is not going to be the perfect thing that it's going to be. You thought that maybe you would become a cowboy, a fireman, or run a candy store? No, you're going to be a CPA. You're going to work from nine to five. You're going to work for somebody that you don't like very much. You're going to do things you don't like very much. And you know what? It's worth it because that's life. Life is beautiful. Life is beautiful because it's imperfect because it has darkness and light to it. And that's something that Israel has to accept. It's something that the West has to accept. Israel is coming to a confrontation with the core crisis. Now, this is the same cri core crisis that the United States and Europe have to come to terms with. In the 20th century, we had the wonderful progressive ideal that we're all going to be a much, much better place. We're going to be progressive. We're going to be pacifists. Every year, every day, we're going to get better and better. We're going to become better people. We're moving away from a world of violence, a world of hate, a world of hostility. Forget the flying cars. Everybody is going to be brothers. All men will be brothers. Doesn't that sound great? When there's a dispute, everybody goes to the UN. The wise and enlightened people at the UN who just uh, praised Gaddafi's human rights record are going, are going to judge and say, you know, can't you guys just live together and be happy? And you know, all the nations are going to go, you know what, we didn't think of this. We should, be, we should be nicer to each other. Why aren't we nicer to each other? But this world, this world is not coming. This world is done for. It's over. For a lot of Americans, the wake-up call came on September 11th. We're not going to have this very nice world. This FDR and Harry Truman, Eisenhower world, it's not happening. The world that we're going to have is not a very nice place because the world has never been a very nice place. Because you know what? The world is full of not very nice people. And we're going to have to live with that. And you know what? It can be good to live that, with that because it reminds us of what we are. Goodness isn't just in being pacifist. It's not in turning the other cheek. It's in saying, I want to protect my family. These are the things I love. The skyscraper, this garden, this civilization, this literature, all these things, I love these things. And why do I love these things? Because they're endangered. We love things that are endangered. Mortality brings beauty to it. It's life that is beautiful. Life as in living things. When something is in danger of destruction, that's what makes it beautiful. If we were to build up this wonderful progressive edifice, these imaginary Greek columns stretching up to the sky, this wonderful world where nothing ever changes, where everybody has food, where everybody is happy, where no one is ever unhappy, this really horrible, depressing place that seems good in somebody's fantasy, if we had this place, it would be absolutely horrible. But the world that we have is the good world. This is the world where we strive for something. There's evil in this world, and that's a good thing, because evil is what brings good forth. In a world where there's no evil, there would very quickly be no good. There would just be lazy, bored, and apathetic people, which is to some extent what we have in the West now. Because we've pushed evil to the side. We've pushed the idea of evil to the side. You don't fight evil anymore. No, you psychoanalyze it. You sit down with a therapy couch with it. And there's no real evil there. They're just people who are misunderstood. They're extremists, but they're not evil. But evil brings out the good in us. For Israel to have a future, a glorious future, it has to have a confrontation with evil. And the intensity that you sometimes see in Israel, those of you who have visited Israel, that intensity comes exactly from that quality. Israelis are on the front line with evil. Israel is facing the core crisis of the West. That core crisis is the awareness that violence is a necessary part of the modern state. That we're not going to that wonderful progressive kingdom in the sky. We are right here, right now, and we need to protect ourselves. And that's just what we need to protect ourselves. We should be protecting ourselves, and we should be happy and proud to be protecting ourselves. Because this is what we were meant to do. This is what we were meant to be. Now, Israel has come to this crisis earlier because Israel doesn't have the comforts and the buffer zones. The United States has a fantastic buffer zone. It has two oceans. It has a huge population. Even September 11th hasn't hurt it all that much because the United States is still fairly comfortable. Europe, Europe is doing pretty badly, but it still has a good buffer zone. 
ISO has no buffer zone. It is small, it is densely populated, it is always on the brink. The knife is always at the throat. So ISO has had to come to this crisis sooner. Now what, now what have the implications of that really been? Well, here's a fun implication of that. ISO hardly has a function to left anymore. Now that may come as news to some of you, but for a moment, imagine if the Democratic Party was down to about six, seven congressmen. Anybody for that? Yeah. Now, in Israel, that actually happened. The Labor Party, the old original ruling party in Israel, the big Labor Party, is down to a handful in the Knesset. There was a joke that you couldn't even bury it because you don't have enough people for a minion. <laughs> Israel, why did Israel's Labor Party self-destruct so badly? Well, let's go back to the peace process. The peace process was the Labor Party's big bid. The Labor Party had no more cards to play. Socialism didn't work as well as privatization. Their, own, their last bid was, war is over if you want it. Bring out the doves of peace. You know what? War isn't over. The Labor Party imported economically, it imported on the financials, and it imported on foreign policy. Those are also the two areas where Obama has imploded. So if anybody wants an optimistic reason for to look to the future in the United States, the same thing happened in Israel. The left imploded on the economy. They imploded on foreign policy. They blew both very badly, and there's no reason for anybody to vote for them. Why would you vote for the Labor Party except because you've been voting for the Labor Party for generations? Which is a reason that many Jews vote Democratic, but not so much in Israel, because in Israel, the, people who, the Jews who do vote for the Labour Party are a smaller group, and there, a lot of them are moving to France, from which country they'll probably be moving to the United States shortly, where there'll be our problem. Omer's, Omer's two sons have already moved. Omer is heading up the J Street conference now. His sons have both moved out of the country, but not before putting up a whole big thing where they refuse to serve in the territories because it's immoral, then they went to serve in Paris, where, where it's completely immoral to serve. But Israel's left has imploded very badly, and Israel is coming to the conclusion that even at some point you have to reverse a bad policy. This was Netanyahu's recent speech to the Knesset. The Knesset is really a fun place where everybody yells at each other for a few hours, and nothing gets done. But Netanyahu said to the, people, to the people yelling at him in the Knesset, you know what, I didn't do this, we didn't do this, even Iran didn't do this, you did. When you withdrew from Gaza, Iran came in. Every time we withdraw, Iran goes in. We're not fighting Hamas in Gaza, we're fighting Iran in Gaza. Every time we withdraw, this is what happens. Now that's a growing awareness that a bad policy that has gone on for 20 years can be reversed. Now America's bad policy on the war on terror hasn't gone on for 20 years. It's gone on for a little more than, a year, than 10 years now. So if Israel can, Jews are described in the Torah as stiff-necked. Now if Jews can start slowly turning around the bad policy after 20 years, there is a lot of hope for the United States. Let me check on how much time I've got. I think I went way over my time. No, I'm not, I'm good? Okay, I'm good. So, now on to the next part. We've covered Iran, we've covered Palestine. Now let's move on to the good stuff. Actually, we had some of the good stuff now with politics. But let's, on, let's move on to the second piece of good news, Israel's birth rate. Now, a Catholic countries in Europe, believe it or not, places like France, Ireland, and Italy have a birth rate that's below replacement. This is closely linked to the fact that Europe is now heavily secular. Israel, however, is actually fairly religious which would be surprising to many Republicans who think that all Jews are secular atheists. <laughs> but Israel is actually fairly religious. And Israel has a high birth rate. Demographically, Israel is in actually in a very good position because Israel has a future. A country with a positive birth rate has a future. A country with a negative birth rate has no future. Even Japan, which doesn't have an immigration threat but does have a negative birth rate, is in big trouble because you can't build a country on robots at some point. Now unless the robots take over. Israel has, a, Israel has the highest birth rate of the West. This is very good news. Now a lot of this is obviously due to religious communities. So lately you've been hearing about social problems in Israel. There are social problems in Israel, big time. As I said at the start, Israel is a marriage. In some cases it hasn't been always a good marriage. 
You have members of the ultra-Orthodox who think that Israel is the devil. Not all of them by any means don't believe what you hear in the media, but, quite, but there are quite a few of them that do. The larger problem is that you have two communities which produce a high birth rate, mainly ultra-Orthodox and Arabs. Now, both of those communities produce a high birth rate because they're separatists to some extent. Now, the doomsayers say that Israel is doomed to be somewhere between Measharim and Nabuz. That's not really true. What's been going on in Israel is more complicated. Now, in the past few months, the media has been really blowing incidents with the ultra-Orthodox, or what's being called the ultra-Orthodox out of proportion. I don't really agree with the term, but we'll use it for convenience sake. What's actually happening is something very different. What's happening is that the ultra-Orthodox are slowly moving toward a middle position on Israel. Now, that's actually a very good thing. Jews are very slow to adapt and slow to change our minds on something. When we go for something, we stick to it. We vote Democrat, we keep voting Democrat. Now, some ultra-Orthodox decided that Israel was a bad thing at the start of the state, and, you know, they've stuck to their guns. But at the same time, the number of people... There were two, generally speaking, Orthodox responses to Israel. On the one hand, you had the national religious camp that said it's the footsteps of the Messiah. On the other hand, you had some in the ultra-Orthodox community who said, basically, this is the devil. Now, what's been happening over time is that people have been moving closer and closer to the middle. Why have they been doing that? Because unconsciously, somewhat against their will, they've been becoming Israelis. They don't know it for the most part, but they have. Now, the generation of the ultra-Orthodox leadership that predated the state, and believe it or not, there are quite a few of them, is now dying off. The people who are taking over are Israelis. They're Israeli-born. And the conflicts that are happening now, all these fights, they're negotiation conflicts. What the ultra-Orthodox did originally was what they did in every country. They said, well, we're just living here. This isn't really our country. We're just in another ghetto. And we just have to make the best of it. Now, there's a reason for this, because Jews have gotten used to living this way. It's not our country. It's just another ghetto. We have to make our best. We have to do our best with it. But now they've been coming around closer to the point where they're going to take ownership of the country. I don't mean they're going to take over the country, but they're going to take ownership of their part in the country. For a country to work, everybody has to take ownership that they have a part in this country. Now, the ultra-Orthodox are slowly, slowly moving to that position. One of the reasons that they're doing that is that their current way of life is economically, financially, and in every other sense, is just completely, completely unsustainable. But at the same time, there are a lot of tensions associated with that. How are those tensions going to be resolved? It's not going to be that easy. So let's fast forward again. Let's step into that time machine. I think there's a door back here somewhere. A staffer will show you around after the show. We'll, step, we'll go over to the year 2062. How has, it, how has this all sorted out? Well, for one thing, there are going to be a lot more beards in the Israeli Defense Force. Maybe even in the Israeli Air Force, though that's a long shot. But the Jews will have found a way to work something out. There was a time when Jews from different countries did not get along with each other. Slowly, slowly, they're slowly learning to get along with each other. Elements of Ashkenazi and Sephardi, Mizrahi culture are blending together in Israel. If you've heard Israeli music, you've already heard that. Now the question is how the Orthodox are going to come in there. It's going to be a slow process. It's often going to be an uncomfortable process. Yes, there will be fights on buses. There'll be a lot of general unpleasantness, but you have to look at the big picture, which is that this is a process. And the end game of this process is that the marriage is going to get stronger, the marriage is going to work. And that's what this really is. You've got one party in the marriage that's been on the outs. Now let's look at the other partner in this marriage, the Arab community. Now it's a prized myth in some circles in Israel that the Arabs in, within Israel proper are completely different from the Arabs in Gaza. One can be integrated, the other can't. Well, I've got bad news. Hamas, or rather the Islamic movement in 48 Palestine, which is the Muslim Brotherhood, as it's called, within Israel, and the Muslim Brotherhood, by the way, is operating inside Israel, have been winning elections. They haven't been winning too many of them, but they're, they're capable of winning elections. So if the current situation continues, you're going to have Muslim Brotherhood members not just in the parliament in Egypt, you're going to have them in the Knesset in Israel, and won't that be a lot of fun? The problem is that the situation is completely unstable. As long as the Gulf oil states can continue funding the Muslim Brotherhood, and as long as the Muslim Brotherhood is going to expand its influence, then the demographic problem becomes much more serious. You've had all these leftists who said, we can't possibly remain in Gaza. You know, what happens when Haifa becomes Gaza? You know what? It can happen. There was once upon a time Haifa used to be Gaza in 1947. 
It was actually a pretty bloody place when the Arabs were fighting over it. You know what? It can happen again. And with the Muslim Brotherhood, it will happen. Which means that Israel has to deal with its demographic problems, it has to deal with its social problems, but it also has to balance the reality of it. Uh, I was discussing earlier uh, Goldman, David Goldman's idea that Israel is going to have the largest birth rate and it's going to be healthy because of that. Well, we can't necessarily project birth rates that far into the future. What we can do, however, is look at the social issues here. Now, separatist communities, religious communities, are going to produce larger birth rates. That means we have to balance the ultra-Orthodox, we have to balance the regular birth rate, and we have to balance all that against the Arab birth rate. How is it going to do that? Europe hasn't found a way to do it. Now, Israel is part East and part West. It's part of the Middle East. It's also part of Europe. And Israel is going to have to find a third path. The Middle East has failed. Europe has failed. Israel is going to have to find a path of its own. The good news is that Israel is better positioned to do it because it has a good core birth rate. It has a highly religious population. Even the part that doesn't actually seem very religious is actually more religious than you would imagine. The vast majority of Israelis in survey after survey believe in God. They attend synagogue now and again. And they think that there is a final destiny, which is rather important if you're running a country, because if you're running a country and you don't think there's a final destiny, then why bother? Look at secular Europe. There's no point. We'll just move on and on and on. We'll bring in as many immigrants as we can. We'll vote ourselves as many pay raises as we can. We'll work four days a week. We won't have children. And, you know, 100 years later, we'll be the new Istanbul. Now, here's one final point, independence. Now, it's not possible to predict exactly where Europe is going to go, where America is going to go. But Israel originally started out being closely allied with France until the goal came along and then France went downhill and Israel's relationship with France also went downhill. These days, Obama could very well be our goal, which is to say he could sever the relationship between the United States and Israel, but the relationship is already dysfunctional. The relationship between the United States and Israel is very much dysfunctional. Why is it dysfunctional? Because the United States feels that Israel is a burden and Israel feels that the United States is a burden. The United States feels that Israel is Israel's bad image is hurting it in the Muslim world, and Israel is constantly being pushed into bad situations to make the United States relate better to the Muslim world. Now, for example, take the Yom Kippur War. Israel could have struck first, as it did in the Six-Day War. Instead, it waited and waited, and it almost got destroyed. And then the United States bailed it out with an arms shipment. Now, this is a common pattern in these events. The American policy forces Israel into a bad position, and the United States sort of bails it out and complains, why are you making me bail you out again? This came to a head in the peace process where the United States pushed Israel into a really bad situation and now Israel has to go to the United States and ask it, don't vote for Palestine at the UN and the United States says, okay, fine, I'll do it but I'm really not remotely happy about this. Now Iran is the point where this is reaching critical mass because the United States is very explicitly saying, you know what, if a nuclear war happens, it happens, but you know what, you're interrupting our policy and we can't have this. Now there was a time when Israel would have just done this when the, Saddam Hussein was developing nuclear weapons, Israel just went and did it. The United States complained, everybody condemned Israel, but the bottom line, Israel went and did it on its own. Now Israel is slowly with Iran, Israel is slowly figuring it out, that there is no other way. Ain Bera. Israel is, is going to have to break with the United States, it's going to have to break with the psychological dependence on the United States and go on its own. Now the question is, in 2062, is Israel going to be an independent state? I mentioned the Second Commonwealth before. For the most part, during the Second Commonwealth, Israel was not independent. Even mostly under Maccabee rule, it was not really independent. It was answering to Julius Caesar or Caesar Anthony, who were not particularly nice to the Jews, by the way, just in case you read any old Shakespeare plays. The real story, they were not very nice. The but then came Rome, Greece, before that, Persia, Babylon. It was really independent. Even during the end of the first temple, Israel was heavily dependent on Egypt, which is quite a change from these days. Now in the Third Commonwealth, Israel has become dangerously psychologically dependent on the United States, and it's going to have to become independent. The Israel of 2062 will be independent, because if it's not independent, then it's just going to be a protectorate, and nobody really has a use for a troublesome protectorate. I discussed the Jewish problem. You know, there are a lot of people dedicated to, to solving the Jewish problem in various ways. The two-state solution is the Western approach to solving the Jewish problem and taking care of it 
once and for all so that there's no more problem with the Muslims in the Middle East. If Israel doesn't maintain independence, it doesn't maintain its self-interest, and there are always going to be people who are going to be out there solving Israel's problems. Now, there's one final thing I want to close on. I've kept you all here probably a bit too long. No, okay, good. Well, I'll talk for another hour then. Fine, good. <laughs> the, whole the whole message here has been about the future. What is the future going to be like? Now, obviously, when you're in a crisis mode, when you're fighting a constant war, then you're not thinking about the future. Part of what I, why I wanted us to talk about Israel 50 years from now is that I wanted us to look at the future, at what is going to happen. Because we will have to think about what we're really fighting for. We're not fighting for a year from now or two years from now. That's what desperate people do. Jews in the Warsaw Ghetto are fighting to survive a day from now or a week from now. If Israel functions that way, as it is to some degree functioning that way, it's lost. It has to think about the future. It has to think about we're fighting for our grandchildren. We're fighting for our great-grandchildren. We are fighting for the future. Now the peacemakers, the diplomats say, whether Israel or not has a future depends on its deal with the Palestinians. No deal with the Palestinians, no future. So they're saying that the future of Israel is dependent on the goodwill of the terrorists. That is a lie. Because the terrorists have already decided that Israel should have no future. It's up to us to decide whether or not Israel will have a future. It's up to all of us. That's what I want you to take away from this. It's in your hands whether Israel has a future, not in the Palestinian Authority, not in the hands of the United States and the fun guy in Washington, D.C., who really is very pro-Israel in the liberal Zionist way. It's not in the hands of Catherine Ashton, the Red Baroness of the European Union, who, while talking about dead Jewish children, managed to bring up Gaza. It's not in any of their hands. It's in our hands. If you will, it is no dream. That's still true right now. Ask anything. Do you want to know the chances of the Mets? Very, very poor. Now, the question that I have is in the Bible, it says that Israel is a kingdom. And uh, right now, it's a democracy. Do you see Israel over the next, you know, going to 2062, moving more in the direction of autocratic rule? Well, funny you should ask that. If you've actually been around the We Could conventions, the usual way of anointing a candidate is to sing uh, Ari or Bibi Melech Israel. And one of the popular songs is David, Israel, David Melech Israel, Chai Chai Vekayam. But no, I don't see it moving toward a kingdom. I think that's a little less likely. But Israel has always been in some measure autocratic because it's a small country and there's a small number of people running things. I enjoyed your presentation. I've got a question about oil and gas. This is a little off the subject. How is that going to affect Israel in the future if they can actually bring in these gas fields? It will certainly help. I don't know that it's going to be the one-stop solution that some people say it is, but anything, first of all, that gives Israel some independence, some economic leverage are very good, and energy independence is important for Israel, by the way. Thank you. Since you don't see two-state solution between the Israel and the Palestinian, the only way we can stay one state Israel is by giving back the Palestinian to the Jordanian government. Do you see that happen and how? Well, if we go that route, uh, if Jordan collapses, then Israel might just announce, okay, this is, if Jordan is in a state of civil war similar to what's going on in Syria now, then I suppose Israel could say, this is your responsibility now. But you know that's not really going to work properly because if you look at Gaza, Israel withdrew from Gaza. It said, we have no more part in this. We don't want to know you. Just stay away from us. Stay as far away from us as possible. And whenever there's a child crying in Gaza right away, Israel is to blame. Israel is to blame. Israel is to blame. So just because you announced that you have nothing to do with it, the world is still going to hold you accountable, and there's still going to be violence coming from in there. So what do we really gain by withdrawing instead of rather taking control of the territory? I have two questions for you. Um, one is... Well, if I'm not sure, sure what you do then with the one with Israel remaining strong, if the world, which you know seems not to like Jews and is all too prone to not like Israel, um, 
Ahmadinejad once said that there was once a country called South Africa. So what I'm saying is, if the world continues to press this apartheid gambit, the world shut down South Africa. What's to keep the world from shutting down Israel in the same way? That's my first question. My second question is, um, if Israel, it almost seems like you think it would be a good thing for Israel to attack Iran, I am inclined to agree with you. But we hear that you know, you've got Hezbollah on one side, you've got Hamas on the other side. Um, what do you think of Israel's ability to withstand a counterattack uh, in that regard? Well, first let me take your first question, and if I forget your second question, you remind me again. First of all, South Africa did not, sh first of all, the world did not shut down South Africa. South Africa shut down South Africa. Second of all, the whole problem with the peace process is that it creates this whole thing that you're mentioning. But before that, Israel wasn't being boycotted. It wasn't being constantly demonized nearly to the same degree. The peace process put a giant target in Israel's back. This wasn't being delegitimized because it's not going to the negotiating table because it's not participating in the peace process. It's being delegitimized because it is participating in the peace process. The whole thing has created a wrong, run, running, bleeding sore all over Israel, and it attracts flies, reporters, and diplomats, and people who want to solve the problem. Take the problem off the table, and suddenly there's nothing to work with. What are you going to work with? Israeli military rule? We had that in the 80s. What are you going to do about it? You can't tell Israel to go back to the negotiating table if Israel has permanently left the negotiating table, dismantled the entire infrastructure, and thrown it out the window. If there's nothing more there, then what are you pressuring Israel to do? Nothing. And as to your second question, now you're going to probably have to remind me. Okay, yes, got it. Well, first of all, Hezbollah is going to start showing Israel sooner or later. They're not collecting those rockets and missiles in order to admire them, or because they're inadequate. Okay, maybe a little because they're inadequate, but they're not collecting them to admire them. They're going to use them sooner or later anyway. The question is a matter of timing. When the next Lebanese crisis happens and Hezbollah wants to show off, we'll begin showing Israel anyway. You can't, it's not like Israel can, do, can go a particular route that will prevent it from being attacked by Hezbollah. There's no such way to go. Um, what do you think of the possibility that if Obama's elected a second term and there's a unilateral declaration of a Palestinian state at the United Nations and during that time the United States supports it and then all the Judean Samaria now belongs to Palestine, what do you think of the possibility of that happening in his sec if his, which I don't want to happen, his second term? Has but the reality is it's not going to really change all that much. First of all, the Palestinians never really wanted a declaration of state. They wanted to intimidate Israel. They didn't really push for it all that. If Obama really wanted to support a Palestinian declaration of state, he would have. And the same 76% would have voted for him anyway. The whole point of the two-state solution is that it's not actually supposed to solve anything. But let's assume that does happen. What really changes? Right now, the United States acts as if the Palestinians already have the full right to East Jerusalem and all those territories. So does the United Nations. What this changes is suddenly Palestine is a state, and oh no, if they're firing rockets, then Israel can declare war. And they don't really, they're not really that comfortable with that situation because it changes the territory. Right now, they can keep insisting that there's an open-ended process that will go on forever. If there's a Palestinian state, then why is there to negotiate now? You've got a state, we've got a state, gig is into hate. The same thing that's happening to them now, unless Israel withdraws. If Israel stays there, then nothing changes. The United Nations, the United States already acts as if these are illegitimate settlements that don't belong there. So now they're going to be illegitimate settlements. Now they're held to be illegitimate settlements in Palestine. If they declare statehood, they're going to be held to be illegitimate settlements on Palestine. Nothing really changes. Well, for the, United States, for the United Nations to do that, they have to have authorization from the United States, which means Obama basically has to go and say, this is something we want to do which would definitely be a very dark hour, but I think even Obama doesn't have that much of a political death wish. And I, if, no, if there's no, it would be it wasn't stopped in Congress, even though it should have been, I imagine this probably would be stopped in Congress. But the much greater danger is that you're going to have somebody like Livni come to power and say, yes, we'll accept United Nations peacekeeping forces to keep the peace. 
and that will work except the internationalization of Jerusalem, and that really will mean the end of everything. I'd like to get your opinion on um, what do you think, either now or possibly in the future, if rather than the idea which exists now of dividing up Israel, even if it won't, won't happen, but that's what the discussion is always about, uh, to divide it for Israel and for the Arabs, uh, what if the idea, promoting the idea that Jordan is the Arab-Palestinian state already? I think it's an argument that we should make as often as possible. I managed to get a prop in there now, or we are in, so at some point in, during my t remarks. It's, something, it's a point that we should make over and over again. Jordan is Palestine, Jordan is Palestine, just as we should keep saying that they are an invented people. How much traction this is going to have is another story, but it's a case that we should make because it demonstrates the fictitiousness of this entire Palestinian nationality or the we're poor refugees and we don't have a state of our own. Um, to uh, survive, must Israel retake Judea and Samaria, assert sovereignty over it, and can it do so? I don't know if it necessarily has to do it to survive, but it definitely has to do it if it wants to stabilize the security situation, if it doesn't want to be constantly be stuck in this constant tirade of violence, if it doesn't want all these nice young boys and girls from Finland and Norway and Berkeley coming down there and throwing stones and uh, writing graffiti on the wall. It has to stabilize the situation because otherwise there's an endless problem and Israel is at the center of this big problem and that problem has to be solved. If Israel retakes the territories, suddenly there's no problem. What's the problem? Oh, Israel is mean? Well, a lot of countries are mean. I, oh, um, I've always wanted to ask you this. Um, it's not a very serious question, but how do you write so prolifically and so much and so often and there's two parts. The second part is, do you work on several columns simultaneously, or do you just come off the top of your head? It's, it's an amazing thing that you do. Uh, the, and that, <laughs> my answer to the first question is the same as Popeye's, cans and cans of spinach. <laughs> Semi-seriously, and I'd like to apply this to everybody who wants to do this, write, write a lot, write a designated amount of words a day, Write 1,000 words a day, write 2,000 words a day, and you'll be able to do what I do. As to the second part of your question, I'm really not that good with the first and second parts because I end up forgetting the second part. Um, so please remind me. No, I can't, I can't do that. I have, if I, if I, this is actually a problem for me. If I begin a column and I can't finish it, it just sits there like a lost orphan unfinished. And I have a lot of these sitting in draft, actually. Yes. I have uh, one question. Uh, if Israel wants to take one decisive action in such a way that will solve once and for all, all the problems in the Middle East, because right now the Muslims have the perception that with time they'll finish with Israel. So the key thing is to make something that to get this idea out of their mind. What is an action Israel can do, one decisive action, that will take this idea out of their mind? That's a very good question. That was something I meant to address in the third hour of my talk. What Israel? When, when Egypt signed the Camp David Accords, which are basically worthless, but when Egypt signed those accords, what that meant was that Egypt acknowledged that Israel was not going anywhere. That's it. Israel is here to stay. <coughs> when Israel signed the accords with the Palestinian Authority, what it said is, if you push us hard enough, we'll retreat. To show that Israel has tank power, it has to say, the Palestinians have violated the accords, we are not negotiating with them in any way, shape, or form. The Palestinian Authority no longer has any legitimacy whatsoever. The two-state solution has failed. We are, our, our discretion will take control of any territories if we feel like it, unless Egypt and Jordan feel like taking those territories maybe for us, and we'll negotiate that with them. But we're not going to negotiate in any way, shape, or form with any representatives of the Palestinian Authority with Hamas or with any bunch of crazy guys with beards and machine guns. That's it. And that will show that Israel is staying power because it's not going to be pushed out. The thing is that there were some Arabs, some Arab families and clans who made a deal with Israel early on. They said the Jews are coming, they're here to stay. Let's, let's work this out with them. 
There were others like, who said, let's fight them. Let's fight them. If we push them hard enough, they're just a bunch of dirty yahoods, sons of apes and pigs. And if we push them hard enough, they'll run away. When Israel made the deal with the PLO, it said that the second part, the guys, the Holy War Army, the Mufti of Jerusalem, all those guys were right all along. If you push them hard enough, the Jews will retreat. Uh, my question to you is, it, first of all, thank you very much. You are amazing. And secondly, I wanted to know how destructive our uh, liberal media and what we uh, you know, collectively or personally can do to really stop them and you know, introduce people to facts and the truth. Well, the, liber the media is destructive in two ways. One is because it's sensational, not necessarily liberal, but sensational, so it looks for problems. If you give it a constant, open, bleeding sore of a problem, then it's going to fasten on it and drink as much blood as it can. It does this for political reasons, but it also does this for apolitical reasons because the media is very, very creepy. The second part, what we can do, first of all, we have to fight back against the consensus that's being pushed by a small number of people like Peter Baynard or J Street, that Jews are now on board with this, that Jews are on board with the two-state solution, Jews are on board with Obama, Jews are on board with the liberal approach. We have to prevent this manufactured consensus from taking hold. We have to speak out against it, resist it, and announce it at every single opportunity and say to these people, you do not speak for us, you do not speak for the Jewish community, you're a bunch of Uncle Toms or the Jewish version Uncle Howards, and you don't represent us in any way. There's a Yiddish expression, but I don't want to say it for polite reasons, but I think some of you can think of it. Uh, Daniel, if, if tomorrow or the next day, uh, there, a, a group of amorphous Palestinian Muslim whatevers leave a dirty bomb in Tel Aviv, wipes out thousands, the city becomes unlivable. The country survives, it exists, uh, the government's intact. What does Israel do? How, do, how, do they, how does Israel combat What them? should it do or what will it do? They're not the same thing, unfortunately. Oh. What will it do, unfortunately, is probably go to Washington and ask it to file a resolution to the UN Security Council. What I would hope they would do is that they would actually say enough is enough. Israel has hit that point sometime. After the Passover massacre, when at the Park Hotel in Netanya, Sharon said, okay, we're done here. That's it. We're going, the tanks are going into the Mukata. We're done. We're not going to take this anymore. And for a while, it actually stuck. After a dirty bomb, after severe damage in Tel Aviv, first of all, Tel Aviv has a very insular political culture. If, there was, if the, this hit actually very close to home in a very large way, it might completely break the support of the, of the left for, this, for the constant peace process. And that would basically end game. Israel goes back to the way things were in the 70s. Two part question. Oh, no. You can answer in any order you'd like. The first has to do with my perception of the IDF. Overwhelmingly legitimate, good souls, quasi-liberal, but are willing to shoot a child carrying a explosive vest. They're being hindered in their actions by people like Barack. What can Israelis do about that? Part one. Second, in the United States, as well as elsewhere, there are speakers, excellent speakers like you, that are in forums, in universities, for example, that are heavily boycotted, not only by the Jews, but those that hate the Jews, including the Muslims. What to do about that? Well, as to your first question, which hopefully I still remember, because I'm really not that good with two-part questions. Okay, what was your first question again? <laughs> No, okay, seriously, what can we do about, two part, what can we do about uh, boycotts of pro-Israel speakers on campus? Well, first of all, we can come out and show our support for them. 
but uh, a, a large part of that, what is getting at the campus politics, and campus politics is about campus organizations. That means organizing Jewish students on campus. Muslim students are very organized on campus. The Muslim Students Association, there's a pamphlet out there about it, Muslim hate groups on campus, that you might find interesting. Muslim groups on campus have been organized for a while. The left is very organized on campus. Jewish groups are middlingly organized. You've got groups like Hillel, some of which are really bad on some campuses, but even the good ones are sort of, you know, Israel is a nice place. Why do you hate Israel? Why can't we all just get along? And you have to organize a more militant Jewish campus presence for those speakers to have their support, because without that, the speakers are going to come. They're going to be booed off stage, and they're going to be the usual lawsuits about how awful Muslim students are on campus, but it's not really going to make any traction. IDF. Well, the, as far as the IDF goes, again, you've got a somewhat similar problem because you've got a small number of groups like Maxim Watch who are very aggressively harassing soldiers. But the larger problem is this, that Israel has committed itself to Hasbarat, to the image war. Israel has committed itself to winning the image war, but the image war is not winnable. Israel can ship entire hospitals over to Haiti. It's not going to fix anything. Meanwhile, Hamas and whoever can use babies as human rights, uh, as human shields, and the human rights people are going to come out and applaud for them, and the narrative is still going to shift their way. The problem is, Israel, let's say you're a, P, you're a PR guy for a movie star who has a drug problem. So can you fix the PR problem without fixing the drug problem? The drug problem is the peace process. The drug problem is Israel's whole idea that you can fix the PR problem without changing the facts on the ground. You can't do that. You have to change the facts on the ground to change the situation. Now, the, what's going on with the IDF, what's going on with the American soldiers in Afghanistan on operating on the very tight rules of engagement is this whole idea that we're going to win the hearts and minds of somebody or other. You're not going to win anybody's hearts and minds. You can either win the war or you can, win the, or you can lose the hearts and minds and lose the war. This has been terrific. Um, I was just wondering if it, it seems to me that since the Christians and, and Americans and most people are very pro are still very pro Israel, that if Israel just boil it down to its most basic, the most basic contentions that it possibly can and, and um, um, requirements that it possibly can, if they're going to do any negotiating with anybody, number one is that the, the the animating or motivating publication or whatever that 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 the other side is using has in its in, in its very pages. The, the Jews are apes and pigs, and, or dimmies, or whatever, and that they, they're, so there cannot be any kind of mutual respect between the parties, number one, and number two, that they will not accept Israel's most basic right to exist. And, and, and after that, with those two things, there, there's nothing else to say. And so why, why do we even have any, why they, if, if Israel just kept saying that, that they can't negotiate with anybody who feels that way, those two ways, then I, I would think everybody, um, certainly most people in America and, and even the Western world, has to agree with that. No? The problem is they're, they're not really saying it. What they're saying is we don't want to negotiate. We want, with people who think like this, we want them to say that Israel has a right to exist and this is a dead end because you've already agreed to negotiate with them. We're just discussing the price at this point, like the old joke says. Back when Bush Sr. tried to bully Israel to the negotiating table, Israel said no. And there was a whole big blow up, but it was clearly understood that Israel was not at the table. Israel was not coming to the table with the PLO, so it's a non-starter. Then Israel actually did the thing. It shook hands with Arafat. And now we're just discussing the price. Okay, so we want the Palestinian Authority to pass a resolution recognizing Israel. They'll fake a resolution. They'll say, we can't do that. And the United States will say, okay, do you really want this so badly? It's not that important. Why don't we focus on peace? And all this gets lost in the middle. To actually break the cycle, you have to say firmly and clearly, no more negotiations, no more anything, we're done. This is over. Uh, until you say that, then we're all just going to be sitting down at the table to discuss how we can possibly discuss the thing we're discussing. And the substantial points get lost because you don't want to interrupt the peace negotiations, do you, with some minor thing like Israel's right to exist? Thank you for your questions. Thank you, Mr. Greenfield. Thank you all for coming out.